Okay, so we're going to get started now. And um, thank you all so much for coming to our third um, Ask Me Anything event today. Uh, we're so excited that you're here. And as you can see that I'm sharing my screen and you'll see that we have today, Ramya. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right. <laughs> and, yes, Ramya. Yes. <laughs> And then she's a first year medical student at um, the College of Osteopathic Medicine at Des Moines University. And she's also in, she also graduated um, in biomechanical bio engineering at Case Western. Biomedical. Mm -hmm. Biomedical engineering at Case Western University. And without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to our Director of Community Engagement, Sandhya, so she can get us started. Hey guys, so I'll be reading a few questions for Ramya to answer. So the first one is, what does the med school application and interview process look like? Sure, um, so we'll start with the application process. Um, so you have to take the MCAT and um, I believe the MCAT like testing ranges are um, like January to August. Um, so you would take your MCAT your junior year um, I took mine in January, and I think that was um, kind of the best time for me and a really good time to take it, um, just in terms of, you know, you're busy with college and you're studying and everything, so having winter break to just focus on the MCAT and then taking it right after winter break is over, that was nice for me, um, but I would definitely recommend taking it sometime your junior year, um, just in case you would need to retake it, you can then take it, um, over the summer between your junior and senior year or at the beginning of your senior year. And then there are two phases of the actual application cycle. So there's what we call primaries and secondaries. Um, so primaries are through whichever, if you're doing um, MD schools or DO schools, like their overall board. Um, so the AAMC or the AOA. And so you'll fill out, it's kind of like the common application for college. You'll fill out like one general application and you'll send it to however many different schools you want to apply to. And then um, those schools will kind of screen for GPA and, you know, all the other good stuff. And they'll invite you to fill out a secondary, which are like their school specific questions. Um, so primaries open, I believe, May 1st. And the general rule of thumb is get those out as soon as possible. Um, so it takes a lot of work to uh, fill out the primary, actually, because you basically have to upload your entire um, undergraduate transcript and you have to type it all in to like double confirm with the transcript that you actually upload. Um, but so, you know, try to get that out one to two weeks after it opens. And then um, secondaries will usually come about three weeks after you submit, because it does take them some time to screen everything. Um, so now you're looking at middle slash end of summer when secondaries should start rolling in. Um, and you'll want to turn those around as quickly as possible. Um, ideally, you're done with secondary applications October of your senior year of college, um, because then interviews will start about a month after secondaries. And so the interview process then runs anywhere from August to February, March, usually around there. Um, and then decisions come out usually I think like a month, month and a half after. So most med schools are on like a rolling admissions basis. Um, so that's kind of like an overview of the two. Are there any like specific questions with that? Was any of that confusing? I know it's a lot. No, that was great. But going kind of along with that, how do, how do you effectively study for the MCAT? So the MCAT is a beast to study for. Um, and I definitely think it depends on major and things like that. Um, when you get your pre-med requisites out of the way, um, kind of the general rule of thumb recommendation is to have like 75 to 80% of your prereqs done before starting to study and taking the MCAT. Cause you don't want to be teaching yourself um, over half the material on the course or on the exam. Um, but as far as studying for it specifically, um, I personally did, I think, like a seven or eight, eight month plan. Um, and I had to extend my plan because I wasn't able to take like a lighter coursework, course load um, my junior year. So I started studying earlier. 
so that I could kind of spread it out more. Um, but you'll want to do like content review the first three months, I would say like the first about third of your studying, and then you'll start doing practice. And that's really what it boils down to is do you have the stamina to take a seven to eight hour exam? Um, and then just getting familiar with the types of questions and, and how they ask things. Great. Um, kind of steering away from that for a little bit and your interests, why specifically did you choose biomedical engineering as your major? Sure. Um, so I wanted to be a doctor when I was younger, um, but then kind of as I got into early high school, I was like, mm, maybe, maybe not because I, I don't know. I just, I wasn't a huge fan of all the memorization and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, I want to do something more hands-on. Um, I like really was into physics, um, playing with Legos, that kind of stuff. And so I took an intro to engineering class at my high school that they had and I fell in love with it. I absolutely was like, yeah, this is definitely more up my alley than like a bio major or a chemistry major, which is kind of what I thought being pre-med was. And it's not putting that out there. Um, and so that's why I chose to do engineering and biomedical engineering specifically um, because it did, you know, bridge my interest of science and the medical field, but with also engineering. And then going off of that, what projects have you done as a biomedical engineering major? Sure. Um, so the way that Case Western Reserve University, which is where I went to undergrad, was structured, um, you got to work on um, like a engineering overall project your junior year. So that was more of an interdisciplinary um, project. So we were working with chemical engineering students, mechanical engineering students, electrical engineering students. Um, so for that one, it just so happened that my project was like through the biomedical engineering department. Um, but we basically built an EKG machine, which was really cool. So like we built like the circuits and all of that stuff where we like had to pick the materials to use for the leads, that kind of stuff. Um, and we like would record EKGs. And then for our senior year, um, you have to do a senior design project as part of like the graduating capstone. And so for that, you actually have to um, like do a full on like you do like an analysis of the stakeholders and um, the market and, and all of that stuff. And so our project was, um, I don't know if you guys know like what peg tubes are, they're like feeding tubes. Um, so like the current process, I think it's like an hour, hour and a half, and it's kind of invasive um, for like some more clinically challenging patients. And so we created a device essentially that allows um, physicians to do like a new type of peg tube insertion that's like multi-point. Um, so I won't get into the nitty gritty of it, but basically it's like we made like a pipette kind of thing. Um, so it was like using like the ergonomics and stuff of, you know, just basic like pipette technique and doing that for like a surgical technique. And so like we built a prototype and, and, and did like testing on it and all that. Okay, great. Um, have you ever had any doubts about going into the field of medicine? And if so, how did you move past them? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I kind of hinted at it. My first doubt was when I was in high school itself. Um, and then multiple times throughout my junior and senior year of college, just in the application process. And um, I'll be quite honest with you, even the summer and August and September starting med school. Um, and I think that's normal. And I think it's a healthy part of the process because you have to remind yourself, right? Like why you're in this, why we're doing this. Um, and it helps kind of keep me motivated. Um, but I will say the caveat to that is having the doubts about medicine, you have to like really listen to your gut. So for me, it was never, do I want to do this? It was always, can I do this? Um, because I think once you start getting into the, do I really want to do this? You really have to listen and, you know, figure that out because at no point is it too late to back out. Um, I think that's a common misconception I hear a lot. You know, it's, oh, I've already started studying for the MCAT or, oh, you know, I already filled out my primary application. Now it's too late. Like now I have to go through with it. And the way I see it is, is at that point, whatever you think you've put in in terms of, you know, paying for resources or the application or whatever, it's only going to get more expensive. You're only going to spend more time. 
Um, so you really do have to want this because otherwise, if you're having doubts at that stage itself, the farther you get into it, um, the more doubts you'll have. Um, in terms of how do I move past those doubts, um, in medical school, it's a lot easier now to see the why we're doing this and like the clinical, um, I guess, aspect of it and like the excitement of it. But um, before that, just, you know, by thinking about why you really want to do it and like what you're interested in, what your passion is. So like for me, it was, you know, orthopedics, sports medicine, physical medicine rehab. I was really interested in that, like using my biomedical engineering, biomechanics background to improve patient outcomes. Um, so just thinking about what excites me is, is where I get my motivation from. Awesome. And then what's the difference between an MD and a DO in both training and practice? That's a really good question. Um, and there's, you know, I just think in general, just a lot of um, uncertainty and like common misconceptions and things like that. But then there's also a lot changing right now. Um, so in the past, it used to be that MD and DOs were certified independently, um, independent programs, all of that, even though um, the training is essentially similar, right? So they're both um, for your programs. You um, have to take the MCAT. You have to go to um, like college first. Like you have to have an undergraduate degree. Um, you know, you're learning about the human body. The head is where the head is and the arms are where the arms are. It's not different. Um, like that. And then both are licensed in all 50 states, can practice, um, same specialties, all of that. Um, so in the past like 10, 15 years, um, like this new overarching accreditation um, agency was created. And so now the residency programs have become merged. Um, and then there's talks of like merging the licensure exams and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a lot changing in terms of the like, training aspect of it in terms of what's different between them, but because there's so much that's similar, um, the big difference in training between the two is DO students have um, an additional training in what we call musculoskeletal medicine. So it's more based on like the muscles, bones, joints, skeletal framework of the body and using that and the mechanics of how the body functions to then treat um, like other pathologies that you'll see. So it's the idea of host plus illness causes disease. So like an ear infection in you versus an ear infection in an 80 year old might be different. And so using the differences between your bodies to help treat um, the condition. That's really cool. Um, so how has medical school changed with COVID? Very good question. Um, so like I said, med schools, are also changing with all these um, changing accreditations and stuff like that. So um, it kind of threw, COVID kind of threw a wrench in the plans for a lot of med schools because this was the year of figuring out pass fail stuff. Um, so I don't know if you guys like are keeping up with all the different changes, but after the residency programs merged, then they decided to make um, USMLE, which is one of the licensing exams, like the first part of it, pass fail. And then Comlex, they made pass fail. And then now they've gotten rid of the practical exam, which was like step two. So there's a lot of changes happening. Um, but in addition to that, medical schools then responded with, well, we're going to make our classes pass fail. Um, so I would say about like a third to half of medical schools went pass fail this year. Um, which is really interesting. So my school is not pass fail, um, but I have friends who are at schools that are pass fail. Um, and so that was kind of an unanticipated change with COVID. Um, and uh, yeah, that has downward implications. Um, but then the other big changes are some schools do have in-person labs, some schools don't. Um, so like at our school, we have in-person anatomy labs in that we can go see the cadavers that have already been dissected, but we don't do live dissections. Um, and that's just because it's having us all in the lab for two hours at a time and getting all the students in just isn't feasibly possible. Um, and then they've had to like cut down on some of our in-person labs. And then I think the biggest change and the most frustrating change is because of all of like the size restrictions, um, our scheduling is just 
black. Like we have double booked things all the time. Um, we have like events throughout you know, the day. Um, like I think one time we had an exam in the morning and then five lectures later that day. Um, so it's just a lot of uh, uncertainty and like un abnormal planning basically. Um, but then everything's also recorded slash virtual. So then it's more about like doing it on your own time but then making sure you actually do it and that kind of stuff. So going along with that, how hard was the adjustment to medical school? Um, it definitely had its additional challenges because of COVID. Um, not getting to meet as many classmates was really tough, especially at the beginning. Um, and I think we're feeling more of the implications of that now as the schoolwork is getting much, much more difficult, um, just because your support system here is more limited. Um, that being said, I think it also has its upsides in that we get to interact with our professors a lot more. Um, just through Zoom calls and stuff like that, their office hours are all on Zoom now. Um, they're able to do like, like study sessions. Like, so if you have a study group that you meet with on Zoom or you can meet with on Zoom, um, like the professor will join that and stuff like that. Um, we like have town halls with our deans. So I definitely think like the university was able to make up for the interaction through technology and things like that um, to help with the adjustment, but it was definitely um, much more difficult. Like it didn't feel quite real starting virtually. And it only like, took us like a month to like get back on campus and all of that. And it's always uncertain, like, are, are we gonna have labs and whatnot, so. And then going back to the MCAT, which part on the MCAT is the most difficult for you personally? For me, um, I think the one that I started out struggling with the most and like had the most growth or improvement would probably have been the cars section or like the psych social, psych social, like behavioral science. I can't remember what it's called, but it's like the psychology sociology one. Um, and that's just because, um, so I hadn't taken a sociology class. That was like the one pre-med class that I hadn't taken prior to the exam. So I had to teach myself that component of it. Um, I'm just not as good at psych and sociology. Um, and it's a lot more just brute memorization than like, you know, applying readings and things like that. So that's why that one was tough for me. And then cars was tough for me just because of all the different strategies to taking the exam um, and figuring out like what works best for me and things like that. And then why did you choose DO over MD? That comes back to my background in biomechanics. Um, I'm very interested in how the skeleton um, kind of bears the weight and the load of our body. And you know, I look at everything from like free body diagrams and, and all of that kind of stuff. All of my research experience has been in um, biomechanics and applying that to pathophysiologies of you know different disease states. And so because of that, the musculoskeletal system um, the additional training in the musculoskeletal system was something that I really wanted in my practice. Um, and I thought that it would be a good foundation for me because it's kind of how I learn. Um, so looking at things from an analytical perspective and combining that with the like disease presentations, like I said, you know, how a disease might present in person A versus person B given, you know, the different like body changes. Um, that was just something that like inherently made more sense to me. And so I wanted that to be part of how I learned the material. And then now I'll pass the mic on to one of our community moderators, Angela, so she can ask a few questions. Great, okay, so um, what helped you identify the med school you wanted to attend and why did you end up choosing Des Moines? Um, so when I started looking at medical schools, in terms of like actually applying, it was probably like late freshman, early sophomore year. Um, big things that I were looking, I was looking for um, was like the size of the classes because I wanted good um, interaction with classmates and my um, faculty. The other big thing that I was looking for is like what were the different um, like backgrounds or like um, majors of students in 
the like existing classes. So for me and based on my like undergraduate career, interdisciplinary approaches was something that like I thrive really well in. So working with students from like biochem, psych, like English, history, like all that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't want to go to a school where everybody was a bio major or a biochem major, or, you know, everybody thought of like, I wanted to have like that teamwork aspect of it. Um, so that was something big that I looked at. Um, and then the proximity to like nearby health opportunities. So even if it wasn't like major hospitals, um, we have five local, uh, or so we have two local like hospital hospitals. We have a clinic that's attached to our building. And then we have two, um, I guess they're like clinic systems. So they're like Mercy Medical Systems. Um, so like they have like all the different you know, ortho and um, ENT offices and family clinic and urgent care and that kind of stuff. So there's just like a lot of opportunity to get involved in a healthcare setting nearby. Okay, great. So this is kind of related. Um, and why do you think Des Moines chose you? <laughs> Good question. Um, you know, it's also kind of just the whole application process is very long. Like we talked about, it, right? It's you know, over a year. Um, and honestly, looking back, I can't say one specific thing um, because, you know, when you have two candidates that look exactly the same, um, one will get an interview, one won't. Um, it seems like it's kind of just random, but I know it's not. So I would say from my experience, it was the way that I crafted my story. Um, and that's super important when you're putting together your application. Um, like we talked about between the MCAT, the primary, the secondary, your transcripts, your letters of recommendation, um, all of the different essays, your interview, that's a lot of different components and a lot of different um, ways that the medical schools are receiving information about you. And you wanna make sure that the same story is being told through all of those different things. So you want to make sure like there's like three big things about you um, that you want the medical schools to know and you want it to be like ah yeah she's the one that you know did x y and z or that has x y and z or you know came from x y and z right like so you want something to be memorable about you and you want it to be consistent and you want it to be like demonstrated through all of your different um components so i think i had that consistency and i think i had the unique aspect of like my biomedical engineering background, um, my passion and how I just like demonstrated that. And then my like willingness and um, like open-mindedness to learn, like to go forward and like the curiosity, like I showed that I was an asset to them and just as much as they were an asset to me or are an asset to me. Great, okay, this is also pretty much the same thing, kind of spoke on this. So what were your med school essays about? Like, how did you make yourself stand out in your essays? Um, so there's, I probably wrote over 75 different secondaries um, essays, just because like some schools require 10 secondary essays. Um, but like the general themes or like common ones were um, how you contribute to the diversity of our incoming class. Ooh, sorry, I'm in a study room. I don't move. Um, lights go out. Um, uh, so how will you contribute to the diversity of the incoming class? How will you deal with um, like stress or burnout? Um, Sometimes they'll like tell you what their core competencies are at the university and then say like, how do you demonstrate resilience or how do you demonstrate, you know, dedication or something like that. Um, and then there's always like the tell us about a challenging time, tell us about a time when you failed, tell us about um, a time when you like either observed or um, like had to deal with like bias of some sort. Um, yeah, I think those were like the pretty big theme ones. And then like you'll get some like random ones where it's like, tell us what like the theme song of your life is and why um, and stuff like that. Okay. So um, what was the hardest part of your journey so far? Um, looking back, everything like more recent seems harder, right? 
well, what I'm in right now is definitely the hardest. But I would say at the time, for me, the hardest thing was probably that time when I was studying for the MCAT, just because, like I said, I didn't take a lighter course load that time and I stretched out my studying. Um, so just kind of balancing all of that was very difficult for me. Um, and just, you know, my like age and um, the fact that I was a junior in engineering at, um, in college. Um, so that was difficult. And then I would say probably the interview process was also um, very difficult just because it's quite draining. Um, and, you know, like for me, I was like flying places on the weekends while still, you know, doing school. And then um, at the tail end of my interview season, um, COVID hit. So like I had two interviews that then switched virtually um, and stuff like that. So that was probably the second most difficult time period. Okay, so do you have any tips on how to prepare for applying to med school? Early, do everything as early as possible. Um, you'll hear people tell you this and um, you'll be like, yeah, 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 you know, I will, but like also like I wanna make sure like my application is good. And yes, you wanna make sure that you're putting out good quality work, but set deadlines months in advance of when you actually want it to be, because that's a huge, huge aspect of getting interviews and getting into medical school since it is, like we said, you know, the, the rolling admissions basis. Um, like I have some friends who didn't start sending in their primary to like September, October, and they missed out on getting secondaries even, which like the general rule of thumb is like, if you submit a primary and you have like above a 2.5 GPA, you'll get a secondary kind of thing. And it's like, anybody can get a secondary from Harvard. That doesn't mean anything. It's kind of like the general rule of thumb. Um, but at that point in the game, like if they already have a third to half of their class set, they're going to be more strict. So you just want to be at the top of their pile. So get secondaries, primary, primary secondaries out as soon as possible. Um, oftentimes you can start pre-writing your secondaries. So like I said, like common themes of like, you know, the diversity and like burnout, those kind of questions, just like start jotting down ideas for those. Um, as soon as you send out your secondary, some schools will already tell you, or as soon as you send out your primary, some schools already tell you what their secondary prompt will be. Um, some schools like use similar questions from previous years. So just early. Ooh, okay. So um, this is, I guess. Oh, and then my other, my other tip on that would be, um, the crafting the story thing, making sure that, you know, across all of your different components, because some of the components are out of your hand, right? Like you can't tell your letter writers what to say. So just everything that you're doing, even make sure you're demonstrating the story. And I think starting now itself, if you're thinking about how, like, what story do I want to tell? And then catering what you do and, you know, um, how you present yourself and stuff like that, that'll really help. So uh, like, for applying med school, so what class requirements did you have like as a pre-med student and how much time in your schedule did you have to take these other classes? So um, the pre-med requirements, and these are just going off the top of my head, so I might be a little bit off, um, but it's like the two years of physics, um, organic and inorganic chem with labs, um, two to three years of biology. Um, some schools have like a year of English requirement or something equivalent to that. Um, I believe either one or two years of calc. I had to do all four for engineering. So I don't quite remember what the calc requirement was. Um, a year of, or a semester of psych and a semester of soch. Um, and then usually like, some kind of, um, uh, what is it? Not, maybe it is like liberal arts requirement. Um, so like, you know, anthropology or history or a language or music or something like that. Um, and then a social science. So like eco uh, economics, um, accounting, things like that. I think like if you were to take all of those courses and like only those courses, um, I think it's supposed to be like you can do it in two years, two and a half years, um, but you spread it out over your three to three and a half years. 
Um, so things, oh, and then also biochemistry. Um, so I would say like getting all of your hard sciences out your first two years is really important so that you kind of can then be ready to take the MCAT your junior year. Um, so like I push things off like economics, I took my senior year, um, my liberal arts class, I took my senior year, um, sociology I took after I took the MCAT actually. Um, so those things, you know, sociology was the only like pre-med rec that I didn't have when I took the MCATs like that, I taught myself. Great, um, I'm gonna pass the mic on to Eliza, one of our co-CEOs. Right, of course. So because medicine is such a multifaceted field, do you think it's difficult to have a social life while you were a pre-medical student, especially with the rigorous academics and extracurriculars? Um, I don't think so. I think it's all about um, time management, which everybody will tell you that I am not necessarily the best at. That's okay. It's a work in progress. Um, and then just kind of how you structure your lifestyle. So like for me, having a life was important. Um, so like staying involved on campus, um, getting to spend time with my family and friends, things like that were things that I prioritized. And I was able to do it even with engineering um, and pre-med, but there were definitely things that I did have to sacrifice at times. Um, I had, you know, very tough academic years. Um, so at times, you know, like my social life was the thing that I had to sacrifice. Um, but I don't think it's impossible to be a human. And I think that's actually something that's really important because medical schools don't want a robot, right? They want you to have life experiences. They want you to be able to talk and engage and, and have like a worldly understanding and, you know, be a human, have a personality, things like that, you know, cause you have to be able to demonstrate empathy and connect with your patients. Um, and so, you know, I kind of would justify my social life as part of my pre-med training. Um, and it's all about balance. So as a pre-medical student at Case, how were you evaluated as a student academically? Um, like in terms of like exams or I guess, kind of what's, what's the question? I mean, you could probably delve into any aspect that you think would be most applicable in this case. So really any aspect you would wanna share with us. Um, so at our school, and I thought this was like across the board, but I recently learned that at some schools, pre-med is a major apparently, um, but at case it was not a major. So it was just a track. Um, so there were no like checkpoints or anything like, like there was nothing I had to do in order to say that I was pre-med other than start taking these courses, meet with the pre-med advisor um, and apply to medical school. Um, so there wasn't like a, a minimum GPA or anything like that to be pre-med. Um, but in terms of like, I guess how I was assessed would be through exams um, and you know, just like course assignments and, and things like that. And then um, like your interaction, your engagement with the faculty um, at Case, that was something that was huge. And um, even to like to get a letter, it was like an application that we had to go through um, to get like a letter from the school. So like to get the school support. Um, for you to have letters of recommendation. So, you know, demonstrating um, interest in different faculties, research or work or life experiences, things like that, um, connecting with them. And I will say like at Case, that was pretty difficult because they were, you know, it's a research one university. So like professors were busy and, you know, they were focused on their research with the grad students. And they were like, what are you measly undergrad, you know, get out of here kind of thing. Um, and so you really had to, to push for their time, um, but it was also very valuable. And since like extracurriculars are another pretty critical component along with academics, what activities were you involved in as an undergrad, whether it be medical or non-medical related? Sure. Um, so I definitely did the thing where you go to the the fair and you sign up for like 15 different clubs and I got all the emails and t-shirts, water bottles, all the good stuff. Um, but the clubs that I actually stuck with, um, so I was a part of a program at our university called Health Leads, um, but I was only there 
like the program only existed for like two and a half years of my four years. Um, so that was at our hospital. We had university hospitals, Cleveland Medical Center um, attached to our university. And um, they partnered with the Cleveland Clinic, which now they've merged. Um, but it was basically a um, nonprofit organization that used college students to serve as health leads advocates. So we would meet with patients in like the women's family and children clinic. Um, and these were all to meet with patients to make sure that they were meeting their non-medical needs. So like things like, you know, paying for rent and paying for utilities, buying food, baby supplies, that kind of stuff. Um, and the idea was that if patients aren't able to meet their basic non-medical needs, how can you expect them to, you know, pay for medicine and things like that? Like if it's between, you know, keeping their house or, or paying for medicine or, you know, keeping the heat are on versus paying for medicine or, you know, getting food versus going to physical therapy. It was like, they're gonna go with getting food. And there's a lot of resources out in the community um, that people just weren't aware of or that you would need like a physician's letter of support. So like if people can't pay for utilities, um, but you have like some medical condition where like you need the heat or you need electricity for you know asthma or whatever it is, all you have to do is get a physician to write a letter of rec essentially um, saying that it's a necessity, it's a, it's a healthcare necessity. Um, but there's a lot of like paperwork and all that kind of stuff that you have to go through. And so our job was to help kind of facilitate that process. Um, so we would go, we would meet with them like either before or after they saw their doctor. And then we would meet with the doctors at the end of the day to say, okay, these are the patients that we've met with, these are the patients that you've met with, like what are their non-healthcare needs and what are their healthcare needs and how can we make sure that like they're getting the best treatment possible because a component of their treatment is their socioeconomic, you know, status in that, how that impacts um, their ability to receive healthcare. So I did health leads. Um, I was on a dance team, so I did classical Indian dance. So that was like a big part of my time there, continuing that. Um, I was in a sorority. I um, played tennis my first two years. What else did I do? I think I'm forgetting a club. Oh, Special Olympics. Um, I would volunteer with them. I think that's it. All right, that sounds awesome. So since a lot of us are pursuing the pre-med track at some point, what is something that you wish you knew before pursuing like the pre-medical track? And yeah. Um, what is something that I wish I knew before? A lot of little things. So like we talked about for the application, doing things early, even though I knew that, I wish I knew it a little bit more. Um, just because I did, you know, my primary and all that early, but I was still filling out a few secondaries at the beginning of my senior year. And like, for me, that was difficult to do with school also. So I wish I knew to do things early, earlier on. And then I think the other big thing would be kind of the crafting my story thing. Um, I don't really think you think about the story that you're gonna have to tell when you apply ahead of time, but knowing that I think would have made things a lot easier for me because it's not so much about checking off boxes, right? Because if you can check off a bunch of boxes, but you can't tell the story about why you're doing what you're doing or why you are interested in what you're interested in, you're not gonna stand out. Um, and if your story isn't consistent across all of your different application materials, you're not gonna stand out. And so I think knowing that would have been really helpful because sometimes you can feel like, well, am I doing the right things? You know, everybody else is doing this. But um, like for me, like my GPA was lower than, you know, people who had four rows or 3.95s and things like that. And so at case um, the pre-med advisor, I remember like our freshman assembly kind of thing that he had for us. Um, he was like 3.8, that's, that's the GPA you need, 3.8, 3.85. I was like, okay, I think I can do that. And then we went to the um, engineering, like welcome introduction thing. And they were like, the average GPA is a 3.1, 3.2. And I was like, hmm, so there's, there's a difference between these. Okay, is like that gonna be an issue for me? Um, but then when you're applying to medical school and you have to fill out, you know, basically manually enter in your entire transcript, um, they, evaluate your GPA differently, that like they look at your science GPA 
where it's only your pre-med classes. So my engineering classes didn't count towards my science GPA. Um, so kind of like you can't compare yourself too much, but you do want to make sure you know you're meeting like the standards and, and the um, kind of basic requirements. But then knowing that your individual experience and being able to tell that story and have demonstrated purpose and passion is more important than, yep, I was in X, Y, and Z, I did X, Y, and Z, and these are my statistics. So going off of that, what do you personally think were some of the most valuable experiences you had as a pre-med student? Um, definitely the health leads experience. Um, and it's unfortunate that the program was ended, but it was ended because of budget cuts, which is a whole thing about the healthcare system. Um, but it's actually very relevant for like what we're doing and learning like right now in medical school. Um, so as part of like your training in medical school, you learn all the, you know, bacteria and viruses and all that good stuff, which is what I'm studying right now, actually. But you also have what like a class or, or um, a component of education called um, foundations. So like at all schools, it's called foundations. It's like foundations of doctoring or physicianship or whatever it is. And it seems like it's the simple stuff, but it's like, how do you be a doctor? It's like, how do you talk and how do you have empathy and how do you motivationally interview someone? Because you can't tell a patient to stop smoking. You have to like get them to think it's their idea to stop smoking kind of thing. Um, and so a big part of that is looking at socioeconomic determinants of health and the impact that um, structural changes have on how we deliver healthcare and how patients receive healthcare. And so kind of just having that experience and exposure to the socioeconomic factors that um, impact patients' ability to access and receive good quality healthcare was, I think, really valuable for me, just because it was a great thing for me to talk about. And it was something that I'm really interested in. And it was a good experience for me to also um, show patient interaction. And then other big things for me um, were um, like my involvement with the different like engineering programs. Um, so like, I think those showed my ability to like work in teams. Um, it showed my um, like thinking and learning style in terms of like a very interdisciplinary approach. And um, and because that was something that like I wanted even in my medical school education. So a lot of the schools that I applied to were looking for that as well. Um, and then um, other things um, with like volunteering, um, engagement in the community, that kind of stuff. All right, so since there are a few minutes left, I'll pass it off to Darshini. Okay. All right, cool. A um, few minutes left. Got to pick some good questions. Uh, maybe we'll start with just what does an average day for you look like? Good question. Um, so it's very different this semester than last semester. Um, and I will say I'm a week and a half away from finals, so I'm a little more stressed than normal. Um, but we have four hours of lecture in the morning. Um, and that's on Zoom. So sometimes I watch live, sometimes I watch the recorded. It kind of depends on the professor, the subject, that kind of thing. Um, but also just because I can't sit there and learn four hours of material without working through some of it. Um, so each day I have to watch slash learn three to four lectures. Um, we have labs about two to three times a week. So we have clinical medicine labs, um, which is like, how to use a stethoscope, how to use an otoscope, like how to do a basic patient exam, that kind of stuff. Um, and then we have the fundamentals of our foundations of physicianship labs, which are like small group discussions. Um, so we have those. And then we have osteopathic manipulative medicine labs, which are um, like that musculoskeletal training that I talked about. We learn like basic treatments and diagnosis um, processes. And so we have that lab and then we have anatomy labs. Um, so those are scattered in throughout the day. And then hours and hours and hours of studying and reviewing and on key flashcards and all of that. Um, so an average day for me is getting up between 6.30, 7.30, um, 
I get to school by like eight-ish because I study really well here in our study rooms and at the library. Um, I'm not much of an apartment studier just because I did that the first couple of months and then it became a lot to study and sleep in the same room. Um, and then I spend 12 to 14, 16 hours doing schoolwork. Um, and it's a lot, but that's medical school. Um, and then, you know, in between taking breaks, hanging out with people, um, cooking, because food is a necessity at this point more than uh, an enjoyment, but I do enjoy cooking, um, grocery shopping, laundry, that kind of stuff. Um, they say that you know you're in medical school when doing laundry becomes a break instead of it's just a chore. <laughs> so that's where my day is spent. Nice. Sounds like quite a day. Yes. Um, one of our questions from the chat was how do AP and IB credits transfer over? Um, like how can they be applied to medical school? Because I think it depends on the school maybe. Um, I don't know if AP slash, oh, I'm not sure about IB, but I know um, like none of my AP credits applied directly to medical school. And I believe when I was applying even, like when you enter in like your biology coursework and all of that, um, some schools will even say like the minimum bio or chem or biochem or whatever math, physics requirements can't be um, like only AP or like you can only have like AP count for like maybe one to two of those credits. Um, so it's more about how the undergraduate institution that you're going to will accept your AP IB credits. Um, but like at Case, since it was like a science and engineering school, like all of my biology and physics and all that, they counted, but they counted as like transfer, or like intro level. So I had like biology 200 and like physics 100 transfer credit. So like it didn't actually count towards um, my engineering degree or like the level that's required for applying to medical school, but I got credit for it technically. Got it. All right. Um, could you expand on any of your volunteering, shadowing, research opportunities uh, as a pre-med and how you got them as well? Sure. Um, I'll kind of do like a little brief um, about each of them. So all three, very important. Um, a, and just determining, do you want to go to medical school? Do you want to be a doctor? What kind of doctor do you want to be? Um, and how do you want to get there? So volunteering, I would definitely say it's important to have um, like medical volunteering, but keep in mind that, you know, I'm, and I'm not saying any of these are, you know, better or worse, um, that like, just because you volunteered in the hospital doesn't mean that it was like the most enriching volunteer experience, right? Like it would be better to volunteer um, like at, you know, like a site center or with like tutoring kids or something like that. If it was more engaging, if you like got into the community more, um, if it was more fulfilling for you, um, than to, you know, be like a phone screener at a hospital or like a front desk reception or something like that. Um, because anyway, for medical school, you have to have patient care experience. So you will have to do volunteering that is patient centered, but you don't want all of your volunteering necessarily to be patient centered or hospital based because you want to show outside interests as well. Um, so I did volunteering um, through like just the community. Um, I did volunteering at the hospital. Um, you and I did FIMRIC together. Um, so that was like my international experience because I did want to do something international, um, but I couldn't study abroad just with like my engineering curriculum. Um, so through the Foundation for International Medical Relief of Children, um, we volunteered in India for two weeks um, at you know local clinics and um, with the traveling doctor and a mobile medical van. And those were like really, really great experiences. Um, and that was something for me that was really important in terms of like how I wanted to craft my story um, because global health was something that I'm really interested in and kind of working off my health leads experience. Um, it was a great way for me to talk about like social, you know, determinants of health and like the different um, like healthcare systems and stuff like that, but that was something I was passionate about. So like I said, demonstrating passion through volunteering, like that's the easiest way to demonstrate passion. And that's like one of the most important things to demonstrate in your application. Um, shadowing, I ended up 
doing all of my shadowing independently. So like I didn't go through any like, I think we have like a shadowing club that's like shadowing case by case or something. Um, but I just set everything up independently, just emailing doctors um, or um, like through the research position that I had, we had like a, a clinician and so like I shadowed him. Um, and then I would do it for like a week to two weeks with one provider every single day, as long as they would take me, um, that kind of thing. And then um, I did ask one of them to write me a letter of rec, just so that I could have someone talking about like my kind of, I guess, exposure slash how I carried myself in a clinical setting. Um, but I definitely think getting lots of shadowing time is really important because that's really where you see what it's like on a day-to-day -day basis and how doctors carry themselves and like how you use different aspects of your clinical training. Um, I didn't do any like scribing or anything like that, but I know a lot of students do. And so like the more time you get just seeing doctors being doctors is super important because it also really helps you when you're learning all of this stuff to be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I remember, you know, like that's why they did this test or, you know, oh, like when, you know, the doctor would read the EKG, like I remember what, you know, an ST elevation is, even if you don't understand it at the time, just like hearing it, having that application is really important. important. Um, and then obviously getting a variety of fields. I shadowed everything from like geriatrics, to um, dermatology, things that I like, I was like, oh, I'm not even interested in this, like, just to, you know, make sure that I was or wasn't interested in it. And then you learn still something from how doctors carry themselves. Um, and then research. For me, research was really important. And it's something that I want to do even going forward. It's something that I'm working on now. Um, so I guess kind of the rule of thumb in medical school is as long as you tried research in undergrad, you don't really have to do it in medical school um, because it's not a huge component of being a doctor unless you want it to be. And if you want it to be, you definitely have to show demonstrated commitment and experience with, or with uh, research. So I started research in high school um, through WashU's like young scientist program. It's like a high school program that they have. And then from then I did it through undergrad and then now I do it um, in the summer slash remotely right now through WashU. Um, so for that, kind of just getting into it, um, you have to email a bunch of professors. Half of them won't respond. The other half, like a third of them will say, oh, I'm, bu I'm busy, but I'll keep your resume in mind. Um, and you just have to wait for one of them to say, yeah, I have a spot, but basically all you're gonna be doing is, you know, running gels and you won't really get much out of it, you think, and you can't get discouraged by that because you have to start at the bottom. Um, but as you start to kind of get work in the lab, then you'll start to get to take on more responsibilities and you really have to advocate for yourself in terms of like, you know, I want to take on a project. I want to, you know, lead this independently or I want, you know, um, presentation opportunities, things like that. Um, but I think it's really great exposure to kind of um, like the, advancement side of the medical practice. And then also just seeing how like research scientists interact with clinicians and then having that um, uh, background. Nice, good advice all around. Uh, we have a question in the chat. What is the National Resident Matching Program? So that is for matching into residencies. Um, and I think that will be changing because like the residency programs have been combined. Um, so it's basically like you say, I'm interested in these five schools and the five schools then have to say, yes, we're also interested in her. And we have a spot for her and then together. So it's not like applying to medical school or like applying to college where you like, you apply and they say yes or no. It's, we have, you know, 500, this is just random, like we have 500 students across the country that are interested in internal medicine and we have 300 internal medicine spots. But those 500 students are also interested in dermatology or OBGYN. So we're gonna try to match them as best as we can. Um, so kind of how it works. Got it. Uh, looks like we're nearing the end or pretty much at the end. Do we have any last questions? 
So there's a question in the chat that asked, if you took physics in high school, would you need to take physics again in college? So it depends on the undergrad um, school that you go to. Um, like my school would only accept my mechanics, um, like physics, like they didn't accept e &M at all. Um, and I took the calc-based mechanics, so that's why they accepted it. Whereas like some of my friends who only took the algebra-based physics, like they didn't get the calc-based credit or you would get like that, you know, physics 100 transfer level credit, that kind of thing. Um, for medical school, you have to have two years of physics and one of them has to be from your undergraduate career time. And I think you kind of touched upon this, but how do you apply for a research position at a university? Um, so it depends on the universities. Some universities like have very like strict programs, depending on, you know, if you're in high school, college, um, med school, that kind of thing. Um, so if they have a strict program, that's even better because then you don't have to, you know, rely on whether or not professors are checking their emails and whether or not they care about a measly undergrad um, emailing them. So definitely look to see if the university has that. Um, but if they don't, or if that's not something that you're interested in, just cold emailing and saying, you know, I think the work that you're doing is really cool. Here's my background. Here's why I'm interested in the work that you're doing. Um, can we set up a time to meet to talk more about the work that you're doing and if I would be a good fit for your lab and just be honest with them, be upfront that I am looking for a research position and I want to know if you can provide me with one. Gail, Eliza, any closing words? Okay, there's one last question actually. And this person asked, how do you find a research position as a high school student? So that's a little bit um, tougher just because um, a priority is given to PhD postdoc students and then undergraduate students and then high school students. Um, and a lot of times, um, the input that's required on behalf of the lab is a lot to train you. So like my research in high school was like learning how to like do, you know, PCR and gels and stuff like that. Like, I, I don't think I really did any research that I like understand, understood the research of um, during that time, but it was just kind of getting that exposure of bench research. But I happened to have a university that did like a high school research program um, of like introducing kids to bench research. So that was like the goal of it. Um, you could definitely try just cold emailing, um, but don't be discouraged if they say no, just because that's a huge commitment for them to take on. Um, even through the program, you know, a lot of the mentors would say, well, it's a lot of work to, to have a high school kid because they know so little and they can do so little. Like it's like they have to babysit you basically. Like they can't say, okay, go run this, you know, um, and you're kind of just like an annoying little, like asking questions all the time. And you're like, I don't understand anything. And like, what do I do? Um, so I don't think it is a requirement. I don't think it is a deal breaker, um, but it's definitely a cool experience and great early exposure but don't be discouraged if they say no. Oh, do you think awards are important? Um, so it's a component of your resume that you can add. Um, but I, again, it's one of those things where it's like, if it is you know, significant and meaningful, great, but it is not a like requirement type thing. Like requirements are like patient experience, um, you know, like demonstrated passion for the medical profession, things like that. Um, you know, random awards, little awards, that kind of thing. It's like, okay, it doesn't really mean much. And med schools can very clearly see through all of that. Um, so don't, you know, like go out of your way to like seek awards. And if you have a ton of awards, it's almost like, well, are you only doing things to get awards? Um, but if you get a significant award, don't diminish the impact of it. You know, you always want to be recognized for the work that you're doing, right? So I believe so. Uh, okay. Again, any last thoughts? questions, comments. All right, well, in that case, it looks like we are at the end of our event. Thank you so much, Ramya, for coming. Uh, you answered all the questions so wonderfully. It was good for me to see you again. Uh, yes. That was yes. really so nice. And yes. yeah, thank you all for coming. Absolutely, great questions, guys, and good luck.